When we focus on heaven being our home, God will provide in our earthly home. When we focus on the step of not tomorrow, but your and I eternity, God will provide a place here on earth of comfort, of peace, of joy, and of rest. Amen. I've titled my message, if you're taking notes, only one gets the prize. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm, I'm gonna get that prize. Look to your other neighbor, the one you neglected, the one you don't like for whatever reason, we'll figure that out later, and say, I'm gonna get the prize. I'm a too. You guys are like, isn't he white? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get the prize there. Okay, I said it. I'm gonna get the prize. Only one gets the prize. Now I know in a day and age, where there's like no more losers in the context of sports or things. I get it. It's like first, second, third. If you got none of those, you're most improved. I mean, that's not the best award. You got better, but there's still, you know, there's most athletic, there's most sportsmanlike. I, I looked up different awards. One of them now is most thoughtful. Like it's not even the sport anymore. It's like you're, you're thoughtful, you know? Like there is no more losers. And I get that. I get what we're trying to do with that. But at the same time, I think it's important in our spirit to have a goal to win. And I want us to understand that that goal to win today should really be a goal to finish the race that's marked out before us, amen? Anybody like to run in the room? Wow. Two, three, a few people. I know you run. I see those times. I'm faster. No, you're faster. I gotta be honest. Unfollowed you because of it. I can't deal with anybody being better than me. I like to run, but I've, who hates running? Let me just see it. It's one or the other. Very rarely is someone like, oh, I'm okay. We'll do uh, university workouts and be like, all right, we're running. And people will act like I just said, all right, I'm going to murder you. I mean, it's, they, they lose it. And then we got Tania, right? She's like, she walks and she's done. She just, it, it's natural for her. But I've found that people either love or they hate running. It's either a joy and kind of a relaxing thing and kind of just get to rest or it's punishment. Anybody know the relatability of running being punishment. I mean, I wouldn't call it this now, it's pretty dark, but they were literally called suicides. The name itself is not exciting. You have to run up and down the court, touch the line. If you don't touch the line, you go back. Some of you guys are getting uh, withdrawn, those, those, those kind of feelings, the PTSD of these running exercises. But I've found that people either love or they hate running. I wanna read James chapter one, two, and four. It says, consider it pure joy. Say pure joy. Pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. But it's not just that, it doesn't stop there. The testing of our faith produces perseverance. If it was just that, we would just have to be tested for our perseverance to finish its work, but it says let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I ran track in high school, anybody else? Okay, wow. The only white guy who ran track. Yeah, I wasn't that fast. I wasn't. I mean, it just, my odds were not in my favor. I did my best, but I started running track, and those of you that ran track would know, you often will run one event, maybe two, but you're not trying to run and do everything. I wasn't doing the pole vault and the 100, and the, I was the 100 meter runner. I was trying to be a sprinter. I was okay, but our first meet, I had been preparing and running and practicing. The 200 came around. My event was last. I was actually the four by one. It was a relay. The 200 event came up and they were like, we need a runner from your school. And I'm like, I'll run 200. That's just double what I normally do. I ran it. I did okay. I think I got like second or third. And then the 400 came up. Same situation. So I ran the 400. I'm like, I'm kind of getting gas. I'm not going to lie. Because I've prepared for the 100. I wasn't prepared for a 400. Then the 800 came up. Oh, we need someone. Now they're just looking at me. And I'm like, I mean, what about him or her? Like, I'm, I'm dying here. And I haven't even run my event. I run the 800 which is eight times longer than my normal event, and I still went into it with the same mentality of all-out sprint. So you can imagine halfway through, I'm blacking out. I'm running like sideways, literally. <laughs> I remember like everyone's ahead of me, and I'm like, I think I'm running straight, and I'm like on the grass. Like it's, I don't even know where I'm running. Someone kind of is like, you got this. You know, and everyone starts clapping for you, bad moment. You got this, like other teams. Oh man, it's a bad sign. <laughs> You got this, buddy? I'm 17. Who call me buddy, you know? <laughs> I finished the race, and I'm done. I'm gassed. I'm burnt. I'm, I'm worn out. I am burnt out in this moment. And then 20 minutes later, they're like, all right, relay teams. I'm like, this is my actual event. I ruined it for us. 
I was the anchor. I was the last one. This is the, re- the run where we all run 100, which is completing a full lap with the four of us. We relay. We grab the baton, the whole thing. I was so slow. We got last place. My team was bummed out. Everyone was frustrated at me. And I began to think as I was even preparing for this moment, how often are we considering ourselves in life burnt out, not because we're running the race marked out for us, but because we are running the race that we were never meant to run in. We are running a race that God never destined for us to run. And you see, not all good things are God things. And we're going to dive into this a little deeper today, that maybe often we put ourselves in a race that wears us out, that God never intended for us to be a part of. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. But before I even jump into this, I want to say this. When it comes to the house of God, that is a race that we are all called to run. Pastor Jeremy has a great analogy and example of your house during the holidays, everyone's working at the dinner table. It doesn't matter what you do. You're a CEO, you're, you're a businessman, you're a student. My mom's going to put me to work. My mom's the kind of mom that's going to put my friend to work. Like you come over, like you got a to-do list. I mean, it's just, that's just how it worked in my house. And so I want to make it very clear today as we learn about this, the race that God has called us to, the the, the journey that he has us on, the prize that he has destined for us to win for all of us includes building the kingdom of God here on earth, includes servanthood being our position, includes excellence in the house of God being our spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. First Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Paul writing a letter, of course, to the church of Corinth says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? I mean, today, at the very least, even without most improved and most thoughtful, we have first, second, and third. But here we see when he is addressing the church of Corinth, he is saying only one is going to get the prize. Keep that in mind. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Okay. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last Forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Our world does not need one more pastor, one more leader, one more business owner, one more actor who is going to preach the word of God but not live the word of God. Our world does not need one more mom or dad who is going to preach the word of God but not love through the word of God. Our world does not need one more influencer, one more entrepreneur, one more law enforcement officer who is going to preach the word of God but not live the word of God. Amen? Our world is tired of hearing it. They are ready to see it, not just from the platform, which that is the case as well, but through the lives of those who say, I am a follower, I am a son and a daughter of the Most High God. I heard a quote once said, always preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Our life should preach the goodness, the faithfulness, the love, the joy, the hope of Jesus. If the only moment you feel you have the opportunity to preach is on a pedestal, on a stage with a microphone, we've missed the reality that every day we walk outside of our apartment, of our house, into our job, into our family, we have the ability to share and spread the gospel of Jesus. Amen? Man, I believe something shifts in the house of God. I believe something shifts and revival takes place in Los Angeles and wherever you're watching from, in San Diego, when we say, I am the house of God and I'm going to bring the presence of God with me wherever I go. Those of you taking notes, I have a couple points that I want to break down together. And I believe at the end today, there is going to be a specific moment in the altar where we are able to realign the prize that we are chasing after. Number one, run to win the prize. Is it just me, or does anybody not like playing games with no winner? Me and Ben and a couple other honest, like, like someone's like, you want to play a game? Like, yeah, how do you win? Oh, there's no winner. All right, then I'm not playing. Like, I mean, I need to beat you. Who am I better than? Like, there, I guess it's my flesh, I'll be honest. Vicky, I don't know where you're at. Vicky, she's that way. I know some people who it's like, we're friends until like all of a sudden that game where it's got the buzzer and you pass it around. I mean, that gets, that gets scary. I mean, that, that'll test some people's salvation. Like, some people just want to play games to have fun and build community. I, I need to win. I want to beat you. Okay, it's getting a little intense. That was a little too far. 
we have to understand that God has marked us to run the race, not just to give us a participation award, not just to say, well done, my good and uh, attempting servant. No, no, well done, my good and faithful servant. And our faith has to be tested so that what our perseverance will complete and come to its maturity. What is the prize that we are chasing? To give a little more context to this, as he was writing this book of 1 Corinthians to the Corinth church, they didn't have the Olympic games, but they had what they called the Isthmian games. And these games were often, at some points, even games until death. And so when they say one winner, it's not because they didn't want to give a second or third place But he says, I am not boxing the air aimlessly. He's giving context to men who would fight each other with leather straps around their hands and spikes that would come out. I mean, this is not like sparring or just kind of having fun with the gloves and the thing on. No, no, these men often would kill each other. So there was no second or third. What I want us to understand in this is not that we are in competition with each other. It's not saying that all runners run, but only one gets the prize And although I tell you to tell your neighbor, I'm going to get the prize, it's very easy for us to miss the reality that our race is not against those to our left and to our right. Our race is against our flesh. Our race is against every single thing that is trying to take our focus off of what God has called us to. Our race is against the things of our flesh, against the things of our past. And as long as we are focusing on beating each other, we are missing the reality that that has nothing to do with what God has called us to do. We are missing the the context that God is not calling us to be in competition with each other better than one another, but rather uplift each other so that we can run the race marked out for you and I. Philippians chapter 3 verse 14, you say, what is this price? Very clearly he says, Paul, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize you are running toward will determine your preparation. The prize of what you are chasing after will determine your preparation. I went to the gym the other day with a guy named Zach. I don't know if he's here. I don't see him. He's probably still sore from the workout I gave him. (laughs) He's not here so I can say that. I died, okay? (laughs) Yeah, I can't move. (laughs) And Gold's Gym's just different. (laughs) Man, I won't stay on this long because, yeah, I got to, yeah. People there just, like, don't talk. Everyone's just like. (laughs) And the guys wear those little, you know what I'm talking about? Apparently they're called uh, pump covers. I'm like, I don't want that. I don't like it here. I feel weird. (laughs) Nobody talks. And then they just stand there and wait for you. We're, like, doing bench, and the guy's just, like, right next to me. (sighs) I'm like, oh, is he? Zach's like, oh, this is what people do. And I was looking around, and I just started thinking, Hundreds of people in this gym, every single person has a different goal in mind that they are trying to achieve. And because of that goal in mind, that will directly influence their preparation going into the gym. Some people are going in for back day. Some want to get lean. Some want to cut. Some want to bulk. Some want to just sit there on their phone and I don't know what they're doing. But everyone has a different goal at the end of the day, a prize that they are trying to achieve that will directly influence their preparation to get them to that prize. Today, we cannot have a preparation of what God has called us to until we understand the prize of what it is that God has called us to to begin with. Amen? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you run after your destiny, you will automatically distance yourself from your history. Too many of us spend our time trying to resolve our past. I need closure, and look, I'm all for seasons of therapy. I'm all for talking things out. I'm all for going through things so that we can learn and develop from the things that we have walked through. But some of us don't need to be in therapy for seven years straight on the same topic. I mean, let's just talk about it for a moment. I I had to say that I'm an advocate for health and for growing and for maturity. But there comes a point where you got to move on from the things that have held you down for so long. There comes a point where God is saying enough is enough. It is time for you to pick up your mat and walk. You can imagine if he healed the man and he said, don't pick up your mat and walk. Let's just keep talking about what I've done. A year later, two years later, he comes back. Oh, you're still sitting. Man, you did a lot in my life. (laughs) I healed you. You can go. I know, but like I'm still just processing what you've done for me. No, no, no. I've called you to live a life free. I've called you to live a life set free, healed, delivered. God is saying to some of you today, pick up your mat and walk. Begin the race. 
So many of us focus on our start being good, being bad. What do I do? How about when I get to you, God is just saying, run, run toward what I have for you. No more wasting time looking at the past. Because the second we say, God, I'm going to pursue the destiny that you have placed on my life. In the process of running toward what God has for us, we are automatically running away from the history that held us bound for so long. Anytime we try to spend fixing our past could have been the same energy and effort running toward our future. Write this down. Train for your race, not someone else's. Man, me training for the hundred, there was one thing you learned through different exercises and, you know, conditioning and all these things. But when you run a hundred, it's a 10 to 13 second race-ish. It is an all-out sprint. There is no, 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 no stamina, endurance. There is no uh, pace yourself. But you begin to run four times that. You begin to run a mile. You cannot take the same mentality of an all-out sprint into a mile. You ever done that where you start a workout and you're like, man, I'm doing good. And you don't know the, the art of pacing yourself. My wife, one time we did a CrossFit class. I love you. But she, like, it was like three. You ever done CrossFit? It's scary. I mean, it is. It is. I almost died the other day with Coach Devon. I'm still recovering. But we started the workout and it was her first time. So I've already learned, oh, you pace yourself. People are going slow at the start for a reason. 15 minutes doesn't sound long until you've done one of those workouts. And she runs out the gate like the fastest person I've ever seen. She hasn't been working out, keep in mind. And I'm like, oh, dear God, please help her, Lord. She runs out. I remember a guy next to me was like, oh, she's fast. And I'm like, yeah, please pray for her, brother. I don't even know you, but she needs help right now. We turn the corner. She's like, pass me, I'm going to throw up. Pass me, I'm going to throw up. (laughs) We're 20 seconds into this workout. Look, because she mentally was unaware of the pacing and the preparation that it took not to just start strong, but to finish strong. I know our world is obsessed with starting something. Man, every other day, I'm going to be a businessman. I thought you were going to be a firefighter. Yeah, I'm a businessman now. I'm taking Dave Ramsey. You heard of Dave Ramsey? Heard of Gary Vee? Oh, yeah, cool. Two weeks later, I'm a cop. Well, not yet. I'm going to be a cop. And I'm like, man, I, I think you should just commit to, at this point to anything. If you invest yourself wholeheartedly into anything, there will be an outcome that will not come through the short-term game of starting a little bit of everything. We have to be as passionate, if not more passionate, about finishing the race as we are as starting the race. But in order to do that, we have to be more consumed and concerned with pleasing God than pleasing others. Because God is not impressed by us starting something, but others are. It's exciting. I'm doing this now. You can boast in it. People want new. Hey, what are you doing? I'm doing all the same stuff I've been doing, but it's going good. Ah, It's not exciting. I want something new from you. And so if we're not careful, we pursue fulfilling the desires that others have placed on us than fulfilling the desire that God has placed on our life. And our prize is no longer about being obedient to Christ, but trying to please those around us that have a certain agenda for us. And and that agenda doesn't even always have to be bad. It It could be the thoughts of what a mom or dad thinks would be good for us. It could be following in the footsteps of what our family has done for years. I wanna clarify that not all things that are good are also of God. In the sense of making money can be a good thing, but if it replaces what God has called us to do, it is no longer a good thing in the context of the best thing, which is being obedient to our Father. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys doing good? Yeah. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It's important to understand the race that you are running does not just affect you. Because I burnt myself out in those three events that were not mine, and I disqualified myself from the relay race, I also disqualified three others who were depending on me. Who is depending on you to finish your race? You say, well, David, I've been coming here for a month, man. Like, maybe this is for the people who, no, no, who is depending on you to be a good father, a good mother? Who is depending on you to run your business in a godly way? Who is depending on you to be faithful in your marriage? Who is depending on you to fulfill whatever it is that God has called you to do? And until we do that, we are missing the reality that it is not just about us. The biggest lie that we could ever believe is my life is just about me. If I mess up, it only affects 
me? How about your children? How about those that were watching you saying, man, if I know someone strong, it's that leader. If I know anyone that I can call upon, it's that leader. If I, if I can call on anyone for prayer, it's Paulina. She's been faithful. But if Paulina just sees it as, man, if, if I walk away from God, that's just affecting me. No. The reality is us pursuing what God has for us will always affect those around us as well as our family, our children, and all of those that had the potential to encounter the goodness of God simply through our obedience. Run for your eternity, not your temporary. Let me ask you just a simple question. Are our daily lives, and think about this, because I, I know the right answer, but think about your honest answer. Are our daily lives based more out of our earthly or heavenly home? Because we know, right? Hebrews 13, 14 through 16, for this world is not our home. We are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. The Bible would also say that life is a vapor. Paul was referring in the initial context he said, they do it for a crown that will wear out, but you do it for an eternal crown that will never wear out. But it's sometimes pretty hard. Like, let me just take off essentially like the message and pastor hat to like fully invest my whole life into the kingdom with giving little to no desires in this earthly world. I mean, from the clothes that we wear to the things that we want to the things that we want to accomplish and achieve. We'd be lying today if we said, man, I have no desires here in the world. I am only consumed with heaven. I mean, maybe you would say that, but especially a city like L.A., a place like this, like San Diego, wherever you're watching from, it is easy to get entangled in the things that we feel we need to fulfill what God has called us to do. But even Jesus gave us a prime example of even I don't have a place to lay my head at night. So, David, are you saying, oh, we can't have things? No, no, I love what Pastor Jeremy would say. Uh, we can have things, but we can never get to a place where those things have us. Yeah. It's okay for you to have a nice car, but it's when the nice car has you yeah. where everything falls apart. It's okay to live in a nice home if that's what God has called you to do. But when that nice home has you greater than your obedience to God, that's when our priorities get out of alignment and we miss the blessings for what they really are. And they are God blessing us for us saying yes to him. I like this question as well. It's a fun one to ask. I used to ask the youth this question all the time. If, if today was your last day on earth, how would you live it? And to be honest, if they're single, they're like, well, I'll try to find a wife and, you know, do that whole thing. But if they're married or those that are in the faith, often, even for me, it's like, man, I would just drop whatever it is I'm doing. And I would, I mean, I would try to lead as many people as possible to Christ. Right? I mean, that's a, that's a genuine thought. I mean, I'm sure somebody else would say, oh, it's probably what I would do with my last day on earth. I would try to tell everyone about Jesus, and I couldn't help but think, how come we do not live in a reality of putting that level of not pressure but importance on the time that we are given? Because time is the most valuable resource we will ever have. You may walk outside and find $10 and be able to get half a tank of gas, but you will never walk outside and find 10 minutes. So the reality should weigh on us. It should be an honor, the time that God has given and entrusted you and I with to lead others to a place of conviction and true repentance in their life. You see, when we focus on the temporary, on the now, the moment we're living in, we neglect the eternal. But I believe in the same light, when we focus on the eternal, God will provide in the temporary. When we focus on heaven being our home, God will provide in our earthly, earthly home. When we focus on the step of not tomorrow, but your and I eternity, God will provide a place here on earth of comfort, of peace, of joy, and of rest. Amen? Number four, run with intention. We lose our focus when we become distracted. The saying that's always stuck with me, if the enemy can't destroy you, he'll distract you. Maybe today, the things that the enemy would have got you with 10 years ago, five years ago, two months ago, maybe they have no more power over you. Maybe you used to struggle with addiction and substance abuse. Now those same things have no pull in your life. Maybe it was lustful thoughts are these things and used to be bound by those things but you've been delivered and set free thank Jesus so the enemy is crafty he is smart he is the father of lies he is a deceiver 
You know the worst part about being deceived is you don't know when you're being deceived. Especially when you try to tell someone, I think there's, I think you're kind of being deceived. You know what they say? No, I'm not. Uh Uh-uh. I'm not. No, no, you know deceit means something happening to you that is unknowingly happening to you at the same time. No, no, it's not happening to me, though. If anyone knows, I know, and I'm not being deceived. Okay. Two months later, I was being deceived. I was wrong, brother. If the enemy cannot destroy you, he will distract you. I've found one of the most distracting things in the race that God has marked on my life personally is living with unforgiveness. If you are trying to run while holding on to the things of the past, it's almost that resistance training. You guys seen them at the park? They got the parachute. It looks awesome. But what right person in their right mind would go to the Olympic Games with that same parachute? What right person with the baseball bat, the weights on the bat, giving them the potential to hit stronger would also go up to the plate with those weights? We can allow for the things that come into our life to prepare us for game day. But when that moment comes, we have to cut off anything that is going to potentially slow us down or stop us or hinder us from being obedient to the full call of God on our life. Amen? When we don't forgive, we begin to run a race trying to prove them wrong rather than running the race God destined for us to run. You begin to run the race God destined for you. Someone calls you a failure. Now you're no longer being obedient to Christ. Now your whole prize that you are chasing after is, I'm going to prove you wrong that I am not a failure. Man, I'm being obedient to Christ. Your mom or your dad, you're an idiot. Okay, thank you, God. I'll get back to that. i got to prove them wrong, and then I'll get back to the race that you've marked out for me. You will never be successful. Okay, I'm going to spend the next 10 years proving that I am successful, and then I will step back into what God has for me. Obedience is success. If you get nothing else today, the reality that our success is found in us with a whole heart saying, God, I'm saying yes to you. If that means saying no to someone else, if that means cutting off some ties, if that means putting blinders on so I can stay focused to what it is that you have called me to do, today my success is not found in my clothes, in my car, in my friendships, in my followers. My success is found in you, Jesus. Because at the end of the day, whatever we don't forgive, we will repeat. Whatever you look toward, you run toward. Whatever you focus on grows. I mean, the examples just go on and on. What am I saying? Whatever you put your attention on is where you're going to go toward. So often I, I, I try to encourage people, don't put your attention on not sinning. Put your attention on pursuing Jesus. And in the process of pursuing Jesus, sin will no have, have no effect in your heart. In the process of saying yes to God, you are automatically saying no to whatever it is that used to keep you bound and in chains. Now, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to cuss. I'm not going to cut. Okay, eventually, because you are focused on it, you will fall right back into it. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. Okay, you can do that as long as you want. I won't have you raise your hand, but I bet if I were to have you raise your hand, there's countless, if not the whole room, who has ended up in a constant cycle. You ever ask that question? How did I get here again? How am I back in a position again? in these kind of relationships, but only one gets the prize. I don't know about you today, but I want to fulfill God's given call on my life, but it is constantly in competition with the call of others, with the call of fame, with the call of a spouse, with the call of money. And if we're not careful, we try to morph those calls into the call that God has for us. Unrealistic expectations, God said you would be married, but he didn't say when, so you put your own time frame on it and you called it God. God said your business would blow up, so you started a second location of your restaurant and it hasn't blown up, but God said that it would, but did he say when? Did he leave room for your faith to grow? Did he leave room for your faith to be tested so that perseverance can rise up in a place it was never before? And too many of us put these unrealistic expectations and timelines on God when he was saying, I did promise it would happen, but I don't remember promising that time frame. Oh, no, I put that in there, God, because, um, God, I don't know if you know this. I don't wait. <laughs> yeah, I don't wait. I heard a guy say it at Starbucks the other day. Literally, I don't wait. I was like, who's this guy? 
And I couldn't help but think, is there moments in my life, in my relationship with God, where although I may not say it like that, I show it like that by taking charge. I'll oh, thank you, God. I know you were going to do it, but I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting for that money to come in. I'm going to figure it out. I'm not waiting for you to bring along my spouse. You, we put numbers in there. God, I'm 30 blank. I'm 34, and I'm supposed to be married. I'm supposed to have two kids. Where did we get the supposed to be? Where did we get the idea that our timeline always lines up with the timeline of God? I mean, look at the story of Lazarus. We won't go deep into it, but don't you feel like his timing was a little off? Don't you feel like he could have saved him before he actually died? And then he waited a few more days for him to be dead, dead, to the point where the Bible say the man stinketh. I mean, man's was gone. He was getting to a place where he said, look, I appreciate your timeline, but I know what I'm doing. I appreciate your thoughts, but I know what I'm doing. And we have to trust God again that he knows what he is doing when we do not understand it. And as long as we have to understand the timing of God, we are trying to fulfill the purpose of God in our life. We are revealing our doubt and our distrust through all of the questions of why, when, where, how, instead of saying, God, I trust you. God, I, I submit to you when it doesn't make sense. Yes. Delilah, you telling God, I submit to you, Lord, when I don't see it yet. The promises that you've given me, even though I do not see them yet, I still trust you. Even though I haven't seen it come to pass, even though I'm waiting for you to give me the things that you have promised me. And you see, here's the problem I've found. We put these unrealistic timelines. I'm hitting on this for a moment because I believe God is wanting to teach some of you in this room that are struggling with this. And we put a time frame on what God has promised. And when it doesn't happen in our timing, we don't blame ourselves. God promised by 33 and a half. I was sitting there, I was listening to a Coldplay song, and I just, I heard through the lyrics, your wife, something about your wife, and I'm going to get married, I'm going to have two kids. <laughs> and because God promised that, it didn't happen. Um, it wasn't God. Yet we don't blame ourselves for the time frame we set up, but we begin to doubt the promises and goodness of God because of an unrealistic time frame that we set up. And we begin to trust ourselves more than we trust the promises of our king. And we can't get to a place where we, what does the Bible say? Do not lean what? On your own understanding. But in all your ways, not some, not most, not a portion, in all your ways, acknowledge him. I love that word lean. We are supposed to lean our life to where if he falls, we fall. But too often we lean on what we think we can control only to get to a place where we realize even what we thought we control, even what we thought we could control, we can't. The only constant in our life is change. For some of us, I can control my investments. How's that going? I can control my family and my health. How's that going? I can control anything in our life. No, 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 we have to just say, God, I give you the authority to not just have control, but to have overall dominion and power in my life, in my family, in my finances. And I trust you not with some, but with all. My last point, number five, for those of you taking notes, run by example. What does he say at the end of the verse? No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. We have to understand that we need to make our flesh our slave, not our master. I'll put it in easier context for us to understand. We do not do what we feel as believers just feels right in the moment. Follow your heart. Follow your gut. No, no, no. I'm not trying to follow anything other than Jesus. Because I've followed my instinct and I've been wrong. I've followed my heart and I've been embarrassed. I've followed my gut and I was completely in the wrong. The only thing that we can trust following wholeheartedly is the promises and goodness of God. And until we say, God, I'm not going to trust you with some but with everything, we will end up in positions and cycles asking that question, how did I get here again? But if we are really going to obtain the prize that God has marked out for you and I, we have to be concerned on one thing, and that is saying yes to Jesus. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
The world is looking for people to pray as an example. The world is looking for people that will lead by example, that will love by example. They're tired of hearing by example. The word itself, example, is not something that is being said, but is being done. If I'm going to be an example to someone younger than me, I have to show them what it looks like to do it, not just talk about it. If I'm going to be able to be someone that I can get to heaven and Father God will look at me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I have to be someone that is not just going to talk about it, but is going to do it. Whether eyes are on me or eyes are off me. Whether I'm on the stage or I'm just at home with my family. Whether I get cut off in traffic or I'm at the grocery store and someone cuts in line. Oh, were you here? I go for it. I have to get to a place where I am consumed with being all that God has called me to be. And I don't want to prepare for a race that God never intended for me to be in. Man, I'm burnt out. Well, show me the races that you're running. Are you still trying to fulfill the, the word that's been on your life? from someone who said something negative about you? Are you still trying to become all that they said you would never become? Are you trying to be obedient to the voice of a mother and a father? And look, yes, I know a commandment is to honor your father and mother, but greater than honoring our father and mother is honoring God. Now, I'm not saying dishonor because I believe in the process of honoring God, we will honor those around us. But we have to be so consumed with saying yes to Jesus that even if it means saying no to someone else, we are okay with that. I am on a mission and a journey preparing for the race that God has marked out for me. I wanna read this verse as we close. Hebrews 12, one through two says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, there we see that word again, the race marked out for us. I couldn't help but think, one that's at the Oscars, no big. (laughs) (laughs) This trophy looks like something else. Just go with me, I know it's plastic, and thank you, Matt. This trophy looks a lot like an idol. What's the difference? I started thinking about this because an idol is anything that we place before God. And although none of us probably would openly say, oh yeah, I worship idols. Any of us that put our focus, our attention, and our worship on something other than Jesus, that's an idol. I believe when we're saying yes to what God has for us, when we are being obedient to Christ, not in competition with others, not putting someone down so that we can get ahead, saying, God, obedience is success, then I am successful In your eyes, I believe this becomes a prize at the end of the race that God has marked out for us. But in that same journey, if anything we put before Christ is not a prize, but it is an idol, this one item could easily be taken either direction. God, what things have I put in my life that even though they were a good thing, they may not have been a God thing? Two years ago, I closed with this. I ended up in a place of such mental, just like, despair. I don't know another word for it. I had never experienced an anxiety attack. I mean, these things to me were just like, these things were made up. Until you experience it, and then you're like, oh, for sure. I got to this place where I was so genuinely, desperately broken, and I didn't know what to do. 2019 and 2020 and it wasn't like a prayer it wasn't an altar moment it wasn't a worship song and I wish it was because those sometimes are the easy things man what happened I went to the altar and somebody prayed for me and you're like man I've been struggling for a minute <laughs> like I've been going through the cycles and I was in church I was tithing I was checking off all my boxes of saying God I've been obedient I'm faithful in the house of God I am pure in my marriage and my relationship, I'm checking off all the boxes of a good Christian, yet I'm broken. I thought I was chasing after the prize that God had for me, but over time I began to realize that I put things in replacement as the thing that I was running toward. And as that verse says, look at this, so clearly it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin. Wait, wait, so it's not just saying sin is the thing that's gonna hold us back alone. Yes, 
sleeping with a prostitute would be a sin. Yes, smoking or snorting cocaine. I, I understand there's some depths of what sin looks like, but sin is also pursuing something other than Christ. Sin is also focusing on things that God has never called us to focus on. Me missing the mark. And so we have to understand it's not just the sin that can hold us back. We can add things along the way, along the journey, fulfilling the lives of others, fulfilling trying to please others while at the same time neglecting the obedience and the promises that God has called us to. For some of us today, we, we look at this race almost as you're a kid and you see them running. And right when someone says go, one of the kids says what? Oh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Come back, come back, come back. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I see these kind of kids, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you were that kid. I think I was that kid, to be honest. I wasn't ready. All the other kids are like, it's too late. I won. No, 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 no. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. How many of you today to God would say, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. I know. I know. No, no, no. Listen, listen, listen. I wasn't ready. And we're wasting our energy and time that we could be running the race saying, God, can I just restart? God, can I just go back? And he's saying, run the race. It's not against them. It's against you. As long as we are focused on running the race and beating others, we will miss the picture that God is calling us to. We are not here to beat one another. I know the verse is very clear. Well, there's only one w winner, and we're all called to run. But you are running against the things that are competing for your attention. You are running against the things that are competing for your worship. You are running against the things that are competing for your focus. I wasn't ready. He says, it doesn't matter. Run. The gun's gone off. Maybe today you'd say, man, for me, it's, I felt like I got a good start. I've been in church, but I'm feeling a little discouraged because when I look over here, like, they're doing good. And they're also doing really good. And so in the process, if I can't be first or I'm not even second, I'm way back here, I'm going to just walk. Like, I'm going to get to the end, right? I'm going to get to the same finish line that they do, so... If I'm already last, I might as well walk. And we begin to compare ourselves, not to the full potential that God has given us, but we begin to compare to our left and our right. If I'm already back here, then what's the purpose? For some, you would say it's a bad start. For others, man, I'm comparing my life. And I believe there's people even in the room right now that would say, man, I, I think I'm holding on to some things of the past that have been hindering my ability to run the full potential that God has for me. Why don't we stand to Fearless Online Church. Man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, whoever is generous, to the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life and no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more, no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their heart so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life, to get anywhere, really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. 
Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are so into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this message was encouraging to you today as we learn how to lean and trust in the Lord. And if it was your first time today, we would love to get to know you. Don't forget to text FEARLESS to our FEARLESS number, and we'll see you soon.